Welcome to this week's um, Cool Tool Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Foster Huntington, and um, who is a really cool maker. And um, Foster, Foster, would you introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, my name is Foster Huntington. I am a photographer and filmmaker now. In years past, I lived in my car for a while 10 years ago, or a little longer, 11 years, 10 years, 11 years ago. Um, now I uh, live in a treehouse outside of Portland, Oregon, and make stop motion films predominantly. But I've also made photo books and done a bunch of different things, I guess. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. really great. And do you have some cool tools for us that you want to share? I do. I do. I, uh, I, uh, I've heard Lloyd Con. I, Lloyd Con introduced me to your work and, uh, to your website. And, uh, so when you messaged me, I was like, Hmm, I wonder what I would have. Some of them are a little more, a little more, uh, a little rare or not rare, but I imagine you haven't had people be like, this is what I will have. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. yeah. Them, you know. I mean, that's what we like. We like to have a variety of things. And one of the pleasures for me of doing these, is that uh, I always hear about things that um, I had no idea even existed, which yeah. is really cool, and just enter into that world. So, so the thing I always say about these is that um, this is not about like buying about a lot of tools. It's like knowing yeah. about these tools exist. Yeah, and sometimes just knowing that a tool exists is enough to provoke in you an idea about something to do or a way to do it that you didn't even think about before, whether or not you ever get the tool or not. Yeah. So let's hear what your first tool is. Um, well, I'm trying to remember what my first tool was, well, but I whatever. think just just take whatever whatever one you want to show. One of my favorite tools is this. It's a set of uh, Gen Three night vision. Oh wow! And uh, you know, one thing cool about being an American citizen is you can actually own this stuff. In a lot of countries, you can't own this stuff because it's predominantly reserved for military and law enforcement. But in the United States, anyone can buy it. And um, the technology is is pretty wild. It's analog. It's not digital. Oh. Um, so, the, and it's been around, the technology has been around since uh, the f end of the Second World War. But what it does is it it's just an image intensifier and it magnifies existing light like 100,000, 150,000 times. Oh. So... And then, so what it does is uh, it takes electrons and convert, I might screw this up, but I think it takes electrons and converts it to protons and then amplifies it. Okay. And then it displays it on a, a phosphorus screen or a phosphor screen rather, not phosphorus. <laughs> right. And uh, it's either white or green. These ones are, are white phosphor and uh I would describe it as everyone that I show it to is like, oh, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, and so, it's a superpower. You can yeah, literally yeah. see in the dark. So uh, um, what do you do with them? I mean, it's like, yeah, you have the superpower. Um, and so do you like, it's like, I can't, you can't really hunt at night, but do you? No, use I mean, I, I got them for stargazing, walking at night. Uh, like when I, I have two sets of them and, you know, I was hanging, I've mentioned Lloyd Kahn, but when I hung out with him, we went, we rode bikes around Bolinas at night, you know, and you just have, you have a helmet and uh, you have a 40 degree field of view, but you can see everything. Um, so, you know, wow. or all where I live, you know, living in Washington state, it's dark and, it, you know, it, it it's dark for a large portion of the year. So I'll go on night hikes with my dad or, uh, well, it's, watch, good enough, it's good uh, enough to hike with you have enough of a field of view that you actually yeah. feel comfortable yeah walking. people compare it to having looking through two toilet paper tubes <laughs> right um but it's pretty amazing a friend of mine that's in the military showed me his five years ago and after that i was like oh that i'm gonna get one of those someday <laughs> it's it's i would say it's probably my favorite piece of technology that i've ever well, had so and, um are there particular models or varieties that are better th than others? And well, uh, one thing that's wild about it is that the technology around it is so proprietary, and it's also like it's a dark science. I mean, they make them, and no two. It's not like making an LCD screen. 
where it's like with these image intensifier tubes, no two tubes are identical. Oh. Um, and they have these towers where they drip hot molten glass to get like the right dimensions for the image intensifiers. And there's only, I think, three places in the in the world that make Gen 3 tubes. Like the rest of the world has Gen 2, which is just like a different level of image intensifier. But the U.S. is the only country with Gen 3. Right. And uh, there's two companies that make them. One of them is called um, L3 Harris. And then the other company is, uh, what are they called? Uh, I forget. It used to be called another company. But there's just two companies that make them. And they pretty much, uh, they, they're they both Gen 3. And they're, I mean, it's pretty crazy. It's insane. It's so cool what you can see. So the ones um, that you have, wh- what's the, the brand and the model? These are L, this, okay, so pretty much what you're buying is the image intensifier. And these are L3 uh, unfilmed white phosphor. And the way they do figure out, like, they value of the tubes, it's kind of like horsepower, where it's where they take the signal to noise ratio, meaning that what can they discern from the darkest to the brightest? It's like the, the uh, you know, it's like the... Yeah, it's like the contrast. And then you multiply that by the resolution, which is these ones are like 72 line pair. So it's kind of like 72 DPI. It's kind of like yeah. a little bit of a, a uh, equivalent. And right. then you multiply those together and that kind of gives you the level of mm. how, how, pow- how much power these tubes have. There's a bunch of other specs that are important, but these these ones are, are pretty dang good. They're like as good as anything in the military and predominantly people pilots use these so they can fly planes at night and helicopters at night. Wow. Wow. Um, and I, and I have them for night hikes or just watching. One thing I love doing is when there's, you can see there's so many shooting stars that aren't uh, visible to the human eye that you can see with these. So I'll go out on any given night and I'll just watch the sky and see all sorts of satellites that are, you know, aren't bright enough to be seen by the naked eye. And then so many shooting stars that you can't see with the naked eye. And then, you know, just like walking around your yard, so many animals are used to having darkness be this like cloak for them. So like rabbits or cats or all these things are like, they're like, Oh, I know that's a human. And based off of my history, like, I I know they can't see me, but I can see them. But, you know, you can like, you know, so you can walk up really close to rabbits and stuff like that. It's <laughs> it's a total trip. Um, and about how much do they cost? Five to ten thousand dollars. <laughs> They're expensive. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things where the since it's not well, the real deal is that digital technology is going to get way better uh-huh. uh, in the next, you know, probably 10 years. And those are just, just, you know, camera as camera sensor technology advances to the point where they'll be, have some kind of equivalent of these um, mm-hmm. in terms of light, uh, light amplification. But these things like one CR23 battery lasts 24 hours in these things because it's an analog technology. They're super efficient. Yeah. Um, it's that one of these little batteries will last, you know, a day wow. of continuous use. So it, it's very specialized. Um, and a bunch of different companies make the housings. I think in the list that I submitted was a link to a different housing that's made out of machined aluminum. I have a different housing here. They also make monocles, a, a, a monocular as opposed to a binocular. The cool thing about binoculars, you have you know, you have stereo vision, so uh, uh, you can kind of, it, you can have some depth reception as opposed to just if you have one, you right. can only see stuff. But it's, uh, it's real. there's a bunch of really cool. Another thing I didn't add on the list is a thermo monocular. That is super sweet. I don't know if you've ever looked through one of those. What you mean is registering like infrared in the, in the Yeah, thermal. So it's like heat. This is just IR. This is just near IR light. So, you know, there's a bunch of things that you wouldn't realize are emitting IR light. Like if you look at a cell phone with night vision, yeah. it has there's therm there's IR light constantly flashing because it has an IR camera. I think that's partial partially how they do uh 
facial recognition, but thermal is another really cool thing because you can look in your house or you can look outside and you see all these things that are like emitting heat that you wouldn't realize are emitting heat, you know? Also, you can sh- animals and things should definitely show. Animals, yeah, contrast super sharply. So yeah. that's, it's, I, they're not, you know, I think they're tools because it's a superpower, yeah. you know, like yeah. you can, people, binoculars are tools. Well, this is a tool that allows you to see half the day, you know, half of our lives are dark. Right. So this is a, that's a really, way, that's really and there's so many wild applications for it. Um, you know, you can see like campfires from so much yeah. further away. Right. You can see all sorts of different, you're like, I didn't know there was a light there. Oh yeah. That's like someone's garage and they have a light there. And, uh, have yeah, you tried it's pretty, doing photography through it. Yeah, you can. So that's one of the big uses for it. Are uh, astro like people that are in astronomy buy these things and they take uh-huh. photos of all sorts of constellations and stuff. You can see rings of planets and st- with these, like you know Saturn. You can see the rings oh, wow. of Saturn, and you're like, whoa, there's this, there's a ring on that planet, and you can't see with the naked eye. Wow, um, wow, that's really. Great. There's all sorts of different. It's really, really wild stuff. I mean, it, it's one of those things where the first time I put them on, I'm like, okay, well, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And they're, yeah, they're expensive, but people buy spend a lot of money on dumb shit. You know, like, you know, $10,000 mountain bikes, which isn't dumb. I get it. It's cool. But this is a superpower, you know, like there's, it, and that's a, you know, five to $10,000 is a, is relatively inexpensive for a superpower in my opinion. Yeah. And because of how they're manufactured, they have thousands of lot hours of life for these image intensifiers. So it's pretty much, they're not going to burn out. You know, it's not like a camera where there's only a certain amount of shutter exposures or, uh-huh. uh, you know, yeah. stuff like that. That's really fantastic. You're right. I've never, I've never had that recommended. So that's a, it's a new one for me, but thank you. So what would be another cool tool that you would like to share? Well, this is a, a Leatherman uh, Skeletool, tool, which um, I'm sure people have recommended this before, but it's just a, it's just a small multi-tool that has a pliers. It has a locking uh, screwdriver, a bottle opener, and then uh, yeah, a basic knife. And the way, the reason why I like it, because it's, it's actually small enough it's small enough to actually put in your pocket. So you carry that's an everyday carry for you. Yeah, that's an everyday carry. I I carry it in lieu of a pocket knife. And there's so many times where a little pliers is useful. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm trying to think of like you know an equivalent size to give something for reference. But you know, here's a pen, and then here's this thing. It's it's not much thicker. Um, so it's like so. having a fat pen in your pocket. Yeah, it's like having a fat pen. It's pretty heavy. But there's just so many times I, I for years I carried a bench made uh, knife, yeah. but this there's so many times where it's you know for you can have a Phillips head and, and or a flat head and they're actual you know removable bits. Right. So right. Uh, that's something that's you know I would say super useful. Um, and do you just, carry it in your pocket or do you have a little pouch? I carry it, it in my pocket. That's one thing that's nice about this. Right. Um, but uh yeah that's that's kind of my preferred pocket knife and it's better than a swiss army knife i think it's better than a swiss army knife because the pliers is is very useful um and robust too you can cut wires with them you can strip wire not that you need a you're going to be doing electrical stuff with them but you can do and you can like you know here with this you can you can tighten nuts if you need to Mm -hmm. um and then i think the screwdriver is better i mean it was so funny i was just camping with my mom and her boyfriend and we were just like they had a swiss army knife and i had this and we were having a little like you know debate as to what was more useful yeah um this there are i think in a lot of ways the swiss army knife it's kind of antiquated you know where it has like the leather punch the all i think is what it's called it has the you know it has the wine opener which is really cool but so much more wine these days is you know twist off or like i don't think you're like going camping with a wine bottle as much you know people have beer or whatnot um and the, these things are are really 
I think they're really pretty sweet from a knife perspective because so much of what you do with a pocket knife is, you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm trying to tighten this screw with my pocket knife. And I'd be like trying to tighten it with the tip of the screw or, or with the tip of the blade or, uh-huh. you know, um, so many times I've been like, okay, this is sweet. You know, like working on like on a bike ride and you're like, I need to tighten this nut or, you know, here's a Phillips head and a, a flat head you can use for prying and stuff like that. They have one that's like a little more suited for prying and you can get a bunch of leverage with it too. So yeah. Yeah. Which uh, would be great. I and use it. Uh, they're, and they're, um, this is the skeleton. Uh, yeah. This is called the Leatherman Skeletool. S K E L E T O O L. And yeah. yeah, I think they're made in Portland, Oregon, or at least. Wow. Wow. Um, well, yeah. It's a great, it's a great um, carry. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, what's that, what's the, another um, favorite tool of yours? I actually got to go grab it. I'll be right back. Okay. And I'm back. My other favorite tool is a, a Ryko GR3. I think it's a digital point and shoot. And what I like about it is it has a ASPC size sensor. So it's um, not quite full frame, but it's, it's much larger than a cell phone. And this has a fixed focal length of 28 millimeters, which is uh, a really good standard lens size. And as a photographer, I love it. I've taken s- some photos I really like with it. And uh, it's very popular among street photographers because it's small. It mm. fits in a pocket. It has good autofocus. It has decent ISO range, but it shoots a really nice image. Mm-hmm. And I think like, you know, you can, even though camera iPhones are getting really good or camera phones are getting really good, they're still use super small sensors. So optically, it's not that impressive. Whereas with this, you know, I'd be fine putting these photos in a photo book or something like that. Whereas with an iPhone, I would like begrudgingly do that, you know? Um, And they're not that expensive. They're, I've just looked when I think, I think they're like 800 bucks. I've had this one for four years, three years. And the lens doesn't, fully go back into fr- into the body but it, i've put this thing through hell and you can see how you know it has all yeah, yeah. sorts of its scratches right, and the body right, 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 right. is is worn out and you know i just pop it out take a photo i think i have like a you know just a 128 gig sd card in here and this is kind of how i i document stuff i'm I'm one of those people that I don't like having much of the stuff in my pocket. So I, the one thing in my pocket is normally my car keys and a pocket knife. Other than that, I carry my wallet and uh, I actually, I've been shooting a bunch of film Uh 35 millimeter because it forces me to slow down and a little more, uh, you know, discerning with my choices right and uh this is a fuji film uh it's called a Kloss. and the thing that i like about this which is pretty wild is they stopped making these in 2013 or something like that so yeah. it was like a very late uh and they're not they're not as popular as some of the other options of the premium point and shoots but i uh i really like it's a great camera so you know i normally have two cameras in this little <laughs> bag here and my wallet and then a spare roll of film and then in the front of my little case i have a a, a toothbrush <laughs> a uh i i do have uh, this is my original swiss army knife that i had okay. when i was a boy scout all right uh which is you know a little and it's just basic two blade one and then i have a lighter Cause you never know when you're going to need flames. Right. And then I have uh spare batteries. Wow. So that's wow. kind of like, you know, I know this isn't like a conversation of everyday carry or whatnot, but those are some of the tools that I think are super useful 
yeah. to have with me because you know I, I'm a photographer and filmmaker, so I need to be kind of documenting things. Sure, sure. And uh, you know, I also uh, I there's so many times where it's good to have a knife or good to have a, a a lighter or something like that. There's you know, I live rural. I live in the woods, so it's like I cook outside a bunch uh-huh. on a barbecue and. Yeah, I you know, there's always even if you're just using a lighter for just like burning an end of a rope or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think there's ton tons have of. Have you seen the little them. tiny mini Bix for back? I haven't. Oh yeah, the ones are like this big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the ultra lights. It's like you have uh, they're half size. They're they're really great because um, I mean, how many times you're not going to use them up while you're on? Yeah. So you might you don't need to carry all that extra two ounces of weight yeah exactly another thing that i like one of my friends is a is a survival instructor like rural survival like a wilderness survival instructor and he says that he doesn't even recommend people use lighters he recommends people get good with a ferro rod because one thing cool about them is they doesn't matter if they're wet or dry whereas lighters if they get wet and then also um there's nothing that can break on them really right yeah. So that's another like you know, yeah. Fire. But, but I I have yet to have one of those big ones fail. Yeah, definitely. Um, and they're and the thing about the strikers is that you have to find fuel. Well, yeah, you need carry, a, carry a little bit of fuel and a thing, and that's called a lighter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the lighter is far. More, I mean, the lighter is. This is really just like you know I've been I've been pr- trying because it is so much harder to start a fire with one of these. I've been practicing oh. it, being like, all right, I'll oh. have a lighter just in in case, but I'll try first and foremost yeah. to do it with the ferro rod. And yeah, right. it's definitely no. See, it's just like let's, let's imagine what's the smallest little tiny piece of flint I could get, and then some yeah. fuel, and oh yeah, we'll call that a lighter. Yep, <laughs> it's very efficient. So, um, so the, the, so the, I don't know if you're familiar, there was a, a National Geographic photographer named Jim Brandenburg who did this fantastic uh, exercise that was actually published in the magazine where he took l- one exposure of film a day. Mm-hmm. Of Only his face? One. Only one. And he was shooting nature. He was shooting like animals and, uh, it was up in the the borderlands up in Wisconsin or Minnesota. So, he, and he only allowed himself one exposure a day and he did one for 90 days and he did a book later on, but it was the discipline to do one exposure a day is unbelievable. Yeah. Very powerful. And he Definitely. was doing film. So he would basically shot three rolls of film in 90 days with one exposure per day. Yeah. I, I think that I, you know, I, I'm a full, like in my studio, we use all digital cameras and whatnot, right. obviously, because we're doing stop motion. But personally, I like shooting film a lot because of you have less, um, you know, it, like you said, it's, Drink. there's this, you're forced to have, forced to have this, you're discerning so much more being like, Oh, is this worth this exposure? Yeah. You know, is this, is the juice worth the squeeze? And then another thing I think is interesting about it is in the foot race of digital camera production, very little emphasis is put on dynamic range. Most emphasis is put on image resolution and low light performance and stuff like that. And with a digital cam, with a film camera, you're pretty much, you're obviously going to digitize it, but you're outsourcing that digitizing to a, depending on what scanner you use, a really large, powerful scanner that has a way better image resolution or be able to resolve an image digitally than any point and shoot can. So although you're talking, you know, very small differences in dynamic range to the discerning eye, I can be like, okay, yeah, this is 13 stops or something, 13 and a half. And this is 11 and a half. And I can tell, you know, based off of the information and the shadows and the highlights and stuff. So as like a photographer, I'm like, oh, yeah, I th- there still is a role for film photography. I think it's getting displaced now by all this medium format digital stuff, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. But uh, I personally still am a little bit of a 
I like shooting film. I like look. I like looking at it. There's a whole process with it, you know. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I submit. I send in my rolls of film, and uh, a week and a half later, I get an email with a two gig digital mm-hmm. download to my, and it's just like Christmas for me. I'm like, oh, great, you know. Let's As opposed to wrong. being like, all right, yeah, what did I get here? Oh, nope, I gotta shoot it. You know, like it's yeah, yeah. it's a different, uh, you know, and it's more for personal stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did um I shot film early on in my career in, in Asia where I did not see the film for nine months until yeah. after I shot. And that's a really terrible way to learn, by the way. No, it's terrible. <laughs> like it's awful. You have no Especially if you're idea. shooting manual focus or you manual don't know focus, if you're, manual you don't exposure. know if your light meter's fucked. It's just like you're screwed. Right. And nine months later. So yeah, anyway. Um Let's hear about your fourth uh, pick. An AeroPress coffee maker. So um, I, I'm i drinking currently coffee from an AeroPress. Um, and are you familiar with an AeroPress? Yes. I'm yeah, not so, a coffee drinker, but it is, uh, it, it, it is often recommended. So the way I like it, the reason why I like it for various reasons. One, that actual coffee snobs who are do it professionally, like they're doing tastings and guatemala and panama to buy beans for a fancy coffee roaster the way they all taste it based out of an aeropress and they prefer it to you know like these super expensive drip coffee makers Mm -hmm. and what's great about it is it it, from a taste perspective you can control all your variables so much so you can you know ideally you have your your water at a specific temperature like 172 degrees you um and then you have your grounds grinded at the right level and then you have them let it stoop the right amount. And then that's great. So you have amazing tasting coffee. And then the thing that I like about it is I, you know, I lived in the car for three years. I spend, you know, I don't know, maybe a hundred days a year camping or tra- maybe less than that, maybe 80 days a year camping sometime in my car or driving around, you know, like, backpacking or camping like that and the way that i think i love about it is with the with the aero press you can it's the easiest cleanup you just pop out this little can like a little tube and it's just you just get your little compressed ground and voila it's not as opposed to a french press or some other kind of drip maker where you have this mess of grounds with an aero press it's incredibly easy cleanup and it's very efficient from how many grounds you use perspective because it designed to perfectly make one cup. So as opposed to like when you have a fancy drip maker or a Chemex or something like that, you know, it's, you end up wasting a lot of grounds. Mm -hmm. Whereas with this system, it's very efficient. So I, I can, you know, my coffee kind of goes the distance. Um, And I, to me, you know, to me, it's a tool. I, I, I drink like one or two cups a day. And they're also, they're cheap. They're like 40 bucks. Whereas like a nice coffee maker can be hundreds of dollars. So yeah, yeah, this yeah. is kind of my preferred. I have a bunch of them. I keep one in my car. I keep two in my house. It's really my preferred means of drinking coffee. Right. Um, you, there's a bunch of different cool little tricks for them. And the one thing I really like, little known fact is you can reuse the, the paper filters. Um, a lot of people throw them out, but I reuse them. Like, I think you can reuse them like up to eight to 10 times. So you just, you just rinse, rinse them and then just rinse them. Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, that's something that I kind of always, I'll always have an arrow press. You know, I keep one in my car on my, in my car, I keep one with me and it's, you know, it's, uh, a great Coffee is just one of those things that I actually give a shit about. Like I'll, I'm fine eating food from gas stations and whatnot, but I refuse to drink gas station coffee um, or like Starbucks coffee. I can't do it. Really? Yeah. It just have the taste. Yeah. Well, one thing that it's often, you know, well, there's this misconception that with coffee that the darker it is, the more caffeinated it is. And often when it's dark, it's just burnt. They end up burning the beans to the point where it loses all of its flavor and its caffeine. So mm-hmm. I like to just, you know, buy coffee, buy the pound from a place I like, and then I just grind the grounds and make coffee. And it's it's a bit of my 
you know, my morning ritual. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, I think it's the AeroPress is the across all these different situations. I can have the most consistent coffee, you know, from a baseline perspective. So I travel, I bring it with me a bunch, you know, I, right. I, uh, so do I you really still like have a, a modified vehicle to, to, to sleep in when? Yeah. Yeah. I have a Ford F three fifty okay. with a slide in four wheel camper. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I just got back last night from camp, a camping trip. Um, I have it set up with, uh, you know, I have solar and uh, lithium ion batteries in it. And I have a diesel furnace that pulls f- diesel fuel from my fuel tank so I can, you know, m- have it be warm in the winter right, right. and stuff like that. It's. Do you have a Starlink uh, uh, uplink? Oh, I do have Starlink, but uh, I don't bring it with me most of the time because i like not have it being on my phone you know i like i I, i'd rather not have technology with me at all the time but i do have starlink and starlink is it's it's fantastic you know Uh do you have it yeah have you used it well no I, i don't um i have a fiber optic to my house um and i don't have a mobile um you know rv or anything yeah i did i would i probably would have the connectivity um yeah it's really good yeah and like i live rurally here but i just so happen to be close to a a main fiber line so i pay for 100 megs up and down and then i use a point to point relay for about a mile from my house to a tree close to the fiber line and uh but you know the thing about it is if a branch falls, I'm screwed. Or if it's really snowy, like the, the branches will droop over my antenna. So that's the reason why I got the Starlink is a backup. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it's really cool. It 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 draws a lot of power though. So I don't I don't have the batteries in my oh, car to just like maybe. support like a night of internet. You know, I can do a oh, couple really? hours, but wow. okay. yeah, I think it's like a hundred watts or something like that. Like it draws oh. a a bunch of no, juice. I can't believe it because it'd be hot. I mean, it would have to be warm at 100 watts. Maybe it's 60 watts. It's a lot. I remember looking at it and being like, oh, damn, that's a lot of juice. Uh-huh. Um, um, I think it's 60. Maybe I'll look, I'll look it up. But yeah, yeah. I remember being like, oh, yeah, it's pulling it's pulling some pulling some juice. Sustained. Uh-huh. So. Um, so, um, so tell us about what you're passionate about these days or what you're current project is or what you want to share with our audience well uh i think what i'm what i'm passionate about now so i for the last five years i've really focused on doing stop motion films and um i have a stop motion studio here and throughout COVID, i was making a bunch of stop motion commercials and films we have a we just had a project for nike uh, about uh, how they're going to be making shoes sustainably for the ne- for their mm-hmm. 50th anniversary. And then we have a commercial for Rivion coming out soon that we fin- we made. But what I'm really passionate about right now is just kind of re- relaxing and getting into a bit of a creative flow because I'm a firm believer in the idea that creativity is like a, a fuel tank where you can't, you have to replenish it and you have to fill it up. And for me, how I fill it up is having a bunch of time off, going on camping trips with my family, hanging out with friends, you know, going on road trips by myself, getting it into a little hobby and tinkering and building stuff in my shop. And then that kind of gives me, you know, uh, the ability to like, to yeah. come up with new ideas. Um, my first job out of college was I worked at Ralph Lauren, the fashion design, fashion mm-hmm. company doing concept design. And pretty much what we did was just come up with line direction ideas mm-hmm. and, I learned very quickly that it's when you're at, when it's your job to come up with ideas, you kind of, there's a direct correlation to how much, how many ideas I can come up with and how much free time I have when I'm like working 60 or 70 hours a week. I can't, I can execute ideas, but I can't, uh, I can't yeah. come up with any, you know, yeah, I call, I call, I say a good work ethic requires a good rest ethic. Yeah, a hundred percent. You need and I to think have that, sabbaticals, sabbaths, yeah. vacations, time off, goofing off, tinkering. Yeah, and those, I think that's one thing that's really undervalued in our culture right yeah. now is the whole like rise and grind set or whatever, where right, people right, are right. like, you know, really like people are bragging about how 
productive they are and how much they work. And I mean, I've been there. I, (laughs) I've worked, you know, 70 hour, 80 hour weeks on projects and it's, it's fucking exhausting physically and mentally. Yeah. So I think uh, productivity is overrated. And um, rather than spending a lot of time trying to spend as little time on getting something done, I I would much rather try and find something that I want to spend as much time on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So rather than reducing the time, I want to maximize yeah. the amount of time. I mean, I think that ultimately, as time goes on, you know, we are going our difference because there's always going to be machines that are going to be able to do think menial yeah. tasks better. You know, like it's like being an accountant or a tax lawyer. I would not want to be in a tax. I would not study being a a, a tax lawyer and accountant now because in ten years that industry is going to be you know, maybe a 10th as many people working in it just because it's, you know, AI is going to be totally nuking all that stuff. Whereas, you know, being a creative person, you really need it. That's a muscle too, that you need to develop because as of now, I don't, there's a few things that computers can't do and, you know, have making these creative connections and coming up with ideas is one of them. So I think people need to put more emphasis and doing that, having ideas, doing things like writing, you know, like I, I, uh, there's a lot of things that just take a lot of time that yeah. you can't do if you're just executing stuff all the time. Right. And there's definitely a time and place for execution mm-hmm. of ideas, but right now I'm putting a lot of emphasis and, you know, a sabbatical of my own. So I haven't really done much since, uh, since like May or June. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you I've just, played around with Mid Journey and Dali in terms of concept art? I haven't. Okay, so so this is the AI that that generates concept art from prompts. Uh, okay, I yeah I haven't heard. Yeah, of, I've I haven't seen a this. lot of time, and 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 it actually, it is it is creative. These machines are creative. Yeah. Um, and oh, I definitely think they will be. You it's know, re- it's really remarkable. Um, they're not capital C creative in terms of like something that's so so different it changes the medium but yeah definitely thinking of things that no no one has ever thought of before yeah doing it and um but but working with them is the new art and yeah people spend hours and hours and hours and hours working with them to get somewhere that that looks cool so it's not just the ai it's the ai plus the artist. yeah and that's what i kind of think the future is is you're like you know uh you're like a shepherd with yeah. a she with your flock of AI right. coming yeah. up with ideas and you're kind of like the yeah, puppet over here, over here. No, no, no. Come, come back yeah, that's me. wrong. No, that's right. Yeah. Follow <laughs> me. Like come and bring it in. The wolves come are coming again. after you Do again. <laughs> yes. You're kind of directing it. Um, yeah. And so your, your stop motion, are you using something like um, armatures and characters or. Yeah, you- exactly. Uh, it's all metal armatures. Yeah. And um, right now actually we're, I'm working on a science fiction feature film that's stop motion. I've been working on it for four years and we wow. just raised money to do uh, a, uh, to do, to write a script and do casting. We shot a proof of concept, which I'll, I'll send to you offline. Um, uh-huh. It's not, can't show it to the real the full yeah, world yeah. yet, but to kind of give you an idea of uh, what it looks like. But yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm focusing on. I kind okay. of, had does, the does your project have a, have a name so people can look out for it? Yeah, it's called Wake Me Up When We Get There. Okay. Uh, it's uh, I'll give a little bit of the spiel. Um, in the future, I think people are going to go on space trips the same way that we go on road trips today. So, for example, you know, we'll go see a, a distant star system the same way that people road trip to Yosemite. Right, right. And my theory is that people will still want to see and experience these things yeah. with their organic bodies, but they'll obviously put their, they'll, since the travel is so far, they'll put their bodies into stasis. Okay. And then you'll wake up when you get there. So, okay. uh, and the idea is that when human bodies are in stasis, they're going to transfer their consciousness over to these robots. So the whole film is these conversations between robots, you know, on this long travel to get to this place. So that that's kind of the premise of the film. So um, so to occupy the time you're saying yeah. in between 
you'll be downloaded into a robot and they interact with each other in the yes in- exactly to maintain the ship and to make sure things okay. don't break and stuff like that and, and then when they arrive there they go back into their human body and body. take it's a little yeah my idea was it for it was when i was traveling a bunch for work you know i'd see these people who are on their plane they'd be on their ipads or their phones and then they're like oh all right, I'm in front of the Eiffel Tower. All right, click, photo, <laughs> photo, shoot. All right, now back to in front of my phones. Is you know, And I'm like, all right, well, what's that going to look like in 100 years or uh-huh. 500 years? You know, it's like that because isn't, you know, the goal of someone, there's a famous quote about the goal of technology is to smash the the distance between or the time between distance between places or something like that, where it's just like if, you know, you can, if you, so that way you can just kind of control your consciousness yeah. like a light switch being like, all right, I want to be conscious now. All right, boom. All right, cool. Turn it off. When we get to fucking Alpha Centauri uh-huh. or whatever, I'll turn my brain back on and I'll be able to see it. Okay. And yeah, I'll have the the signature space burger at this place and then <laughs> I'll go back to sleep and well, that make sounds sure like that have the robots do all the menial task of like feeding my human body and like making sure the ship doesn't crash. Uh, do, do people remember their time as a robot or is that just, I think they do. Yeah. In, in my, in my universe, they will remember that time. They'll just because be they like, can have arguments the about how they were treated each other when they were robots. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, I didn't like the way you were treating me. Yeah. Like, were, what was that about? You know? Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> and the guy, so well, I had, I had, I had a, I had a kink in my, in my, yeah, my, I, I ran out of hydraulic God. fluid, man. I couldn't move. I like, of course I asked you to, <laughs> maintain the plants like come yeah, on yeah well, it sounds like fun i look forward yeah. to it it's a lot of fun it's you know and it's more fun than making commercials i can tell you that yeah um, well so. um this has really been great foster sink thanks for um sharing your really cool tools especially that um uh light imager the night yeah. vision that's really cool um, it's you gotta see it to believe it yeah you know? it's wow. take it's, a look at one I'll I'll let you know next time I'm down in the Bay Area and I'll yeah. bring by and you could stare yeah. at the stars. All right, we'll go out at night up on yeah. the hills. Okay, yeah. well, All thank right. you so much. We're glad that you enjoyed this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Just want to remind you that we have some other coolish material on our YouTube channel here. Please subscribe, comment, like. In addition, um, this cool tools show and tell is also available in an audible podcast form. You can subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to other podcasts. If you just wanted to listen. And if you're listening, know that there is a visual version of this on our YouTube channel where we're actually showing the tools and um, there's a little bit more of a visual component there. In addition, the same folks that put us uh, the cool tools website out We also put out a free newsletter every week. It's very, very short. It's one page or less. We recommend six very brief items um, that are very succinct, easy to read. You can deal with it in a couple minutes. And every week we bring to you the six cool things that we have uncovered and want to share. And it's called Recommendo with one M, recommendo.com. You'll be able to find it there. It's free. Join 50,000 plus other subscribers every Sunday morning. You'll get it in your email box. And it's actually one of the most popular things that we produce. But we do produce other newsletters as well. One of them is called What's in Your Bag. We have one that goes out to um, tools and tips for your workshop. So you can get those at our website. um, And they're also free. And finally, um, I want to mention the fact that... um, We do have a Patreon, and um, this uh, podcast and this vidcast are supported by Patreon supporters. The minimum is a dollar a month, and for that, you get um, an email to ask us anything. We will respond and um, answer your question if we're able to. There are other higher levels. You can all see those at our Patreon page, and all those links are below right here. So thank you again for being a fan, and... um, We'll keep producing stuff if you enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks to this week's Patreons. They include Rachel Steele, Michael Lenardi, David Robson, Viral Patel, James Borsmer, Daniel Cochran, 
Edge Cetera, Melissa Feldman, and Jeremy. Thank you all.